Mania presents Skinhead Reggae Legends, The Pioneers, coming to the Glass House in Pomona, California, on Friday, October 20th. Plus, the reunion of Los Angeles ska veterans, Mob Town. Also, the Steady 45s, The Scufflers, and a tribute to selectresses with DJs Mila, Lady I La, Rude Blue, Queen of Hearts, hosted by Junior Francis. Tickets for this all-ages show are on sale now at theglasshouse.us. Don't miss out on this special night of reggae, rocksteady, and ska with the Pioneers, Mob Town, the Steady 45s, and more. And now, on with the show. Drummer John Worcester joined indie rock band Super Chunk in 1991, and he played with them till earlier this year. He started playing drums with the Mountain Goats in 2006, a gig he still has. He also plays with Bob Mould, as well as sitting in with other musicians from time to time. John is also a brilliant comedy writer for his work with Tom Sharpling on The Best Show. But before all that, John was an active punk. He grew up around the members of Dead Milkman and attended many punk and ska shows in the Philly area including the Hooters. Today, we talked to John about his connection to ska. When did you first start listening to Super Chunk? Oh, I mean, I guess the 90s, yeah. Let me rephrase that. Did you listen to Super Chunk first or the Mountain Goats first? Super Chunk, for sure. I don't think I started listening to the Mountain Goats till the 2000s. Yeah, yeah. I remember uh, staying up late watching 120 Minutes on MTV, and I saw the video for the first part. And John Worcester does a bunch of dancing in that Hmm. in some pajamas at like a pajama party. And I was always like, man, that pajama party looks fun. (laughs) (laughs) Little did you know back then that you would be speaking to him about ska of all things on a podcast, which you didn't know what was at that point with you, with me, when you didn't even know you didn't know me. Funny how life works. (laughs) I did know you. Well, I want to talk about a um, really important ska incident that you were part of, part of ska history. Okay. Um, Happened, was it one or two years ago? I can't remember exactly. I think it was last year. Yes. In San Francisco. Yes. Ska, no children. Yeah. The Mountain Goats were playing the Warfield Theater uh, last year, and, and by far the biggest venue we would ever play in San Francisco uh, up to this point. And um, we were super excited about it. And then um, Matt, who is our auxiliary guy, he got COVID, so he couldn't play. And so we had to play it as a trio, which, you know, which is very odd for us at at this point, because we very very much rely on Matt's musicality. Anyway, so we were, um, you know, trying to figure out how, how to play this show as a three piece. And then um, we uh, find out this band called Sad Snack, this ska band from the Bay Area uh, is doing a ska version of No Children. And we just thought it would be a funny element to that night since the night was already going to be weird, you know, with just a, us playing as a trio to have them play that song. And, and at first it was going to be, they were going to play with us. And then we just thought, well, it, it would be really cool if we left the stage and they played a ska version of No Children themselves. And then it, it took, it took wings and it became their opening the show. So they, <laughs> you know, it, it was sort of the traditional uh, start of the Mountain Goat show. Lights come down. We had this intro and then they came out. And my memory is they even had a banner. Yes. So it was, it, I'm sure the audience was just like, what the hell is this? And they started playing No Children, and John and Peter and I came out, and we skanked, and it was really fun. 
It was really cool. And, and um, I don't think it'll ever happen again. And um, it wasn't <laughs> professionally documented. So it, it, it lives, it lives in the, uh, in the ether, I guess. And you, uh, you, you were uh, busting the tambourine too, I think during the, I was, I, I was full, uh, fully ranking Roger. Just uh, <laughs> do, do doing him, yeah. Did you? So uh, when we had John on the show and uh, we discussed his uh, skanking technique a little yes. bit because he actually consulted with the members of Sad Snack before the show to kind of he was like running a few skanking styles past them and, and looking for a little feedback. What was your preparation for the skanking? Well, I I've been skanking since I was fourteen, so yeah, it's like riding a bike. Yes. Yeah. Once you hear that, it just kind of, it just, it comes back. And, um, um, what, what's great about, about this interview is I really hadn't, you know, immersed myself in, in the ska that I loved when I was a kid, which is two-tone stuff, um, uh, two-tone record stuff, uh, in, in forever. So to kind of prep for this, I, I went down a massive two-tone YouTube and record hole. And um, it's been amazing. Like I forgot how much I loved that stuff when I was a kid. Um, so thank you for helping me reconnect with my childhood loves. Is there a song in particular that stuck out to you as being something that you were like, Oh my God, I forgot about this. The big record for me. And I, and I forgot about this. I used to practice along to this, record a lot when I was a kid after school. So we're talking like 1981, uh, the dance craze soundtrack. Mm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I loved that. So I loved, um, uh, rank and full stop, uh, big shot by the beat. Um, what else is on there? Um, uh, concrete jungle by the specials might be on there. Uh, too much, too young, maybe great body mm -hmm. snatchers song called, uh, uh, easy life. I, I think it's called, um, uh, Razor Blade, Blade Alley by Madness. But so I used to love that record and I got to go to the movie. The movie played in Philly, which which was kind of far from where I lived. I grew up in kind of the farmlands outside of Philly. And um, somehow we found out that the, the TLA theater on the hip street, South Street, was, was showing a double feature of Dance Craze and Erga Music War, that great uh, IRS Records film with the, the police and Skatefish and oh, yeah? XTC and all those bands. Oh, my God. And people were dancing. Like, people were dancing to a movie. It was so cool. <laughs> so that record and that movie made a big impression on me. And um, it's funny. Right around that time, I started playing in my first band. And, and the band was called Hair Club for Men. And um, it, it was me on drums, a guy I went to high school with who played bass. So he was two years older. And then these other two guys who were like, I was 14. The other guy, other, the singer was probably 21. And the bassist, <laughs> the other bass, we, we, had, two, we had two bassists because you need two bassists, one fuzz and, and one regular. And um, he was 28. So it was really this oh weird combination. <laughs> But I learned so much from those guys and, and the bass player, uh, the first bass player, Steve, he turned me on to a lot of that stuff and he played sax also. So we had a, a ska element to our band and Tim, the other bassist, played Farfisa. So we had those elements, like those traditional kind of ska elements, but we were kind of new wave, but we had some originals that were kind of ska. Um, so we would play parties so this is like the fall of 81 and so, for, for some reason our, our high school which was like like i said in the country it, it kind of went new wave for about six months it was the greatest like everyone was into the like the go-go's and the police and kind of dressing cool and it, it evaporated at some point but but um that was a really cool time in my life because i felt like well everyone's kind of into this cool music and and uh Everyone's dancing and stuff. And, and um, so really good memories. And that was a really formative period in terms of what kind of music I wanted to pursue. So, I mean, when we're talking about a small town, like how, how many people went to your high school? Like just best guess. 
my graduating class, as funny, by the time I graduated, nobody was into this kind of music anymore. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> so, um, I mean, it couldn't have been more than a hundred. Wow. Yeah. So there's not a lot of room for people to break off into other things. It's sort of like, you know, whatever people are into, what people are into. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it was a big, you know, like all the, the, the big bands that were happening at that point, as far as most of the kids in my school, were, you know, were Journey, Ario Speedwagon, Ozzy Osbourne, that kind of stuff. And I just, I just, I didn't like any of that stuff, really. So I want to go back to Hair Club for a minute. What, so what is it like being a 14 year old and being in a band with some 20 somethings? Did they seem like full fledged adults to you? Yes. And, and it's funny. Now I'm regretting this. I, I interviewed Tommy Stinson two days ago and I should have, I should have asked him this too, because we are the same age and we were in the same boat. I mean, his band was actually popular, but, um, uh, <laughs> it, I, I didn't feel out of place really. That, that was the interesting thing was I was always by far the youngest person in all the bands I was in until super chunk. And now every band I'm in, I'm by far the oldest. So mm -hmm. everyone, everyone kind of, kind of fell away at some point, except for me. But, um, um, I knew that was the kind of music I wanted to play and it was the scene I wanted to be in. And I knew nobody my age was really going to be doing this. Um, and it just seemed kind of natural. So I, I also was hanging out with this band, the dead milkmen when I was around, um, maybe 16 or so, uh, and those guys really uh, uh, t turned me on to a lot of cool music as well. Now, d did you grow up with Dean? Is, is that the story? Yeah, D Dean is a few years older than me. And um, uh, how did I meet Dean? Dean was friends with the uh, guy who was the singer and the guitar player in Hair Club for Men. I think they might have gone to college together. <laughs> and um, and so. That's how I knew Dean and Dean had a, had a band. It was a duo guitar and drums uh, called Narthex and Narthex and hair club for men would play shows together. So that, that's how I knew him. Ah, okay. And then when he, he started hanging out with uh, the other guys who became the dead milk men, uh, he would let me come to his house uh, and watch them practice and stuff. That sort of st thing. What were they like back then? Um, they were great. They were, they were super cool, super fun. They, they liked all kinds of music. And, and I, I think that's what accounted for them kind of busting out of, of the punk rock scene in Philly. We, they would play a lot of uh, uh, hardcore mm -hmm. shows, but um, their, their music was so, um, it, it had elements of punk, but the secret weapon of, of, of the dead milkman was the guitar player, Joe, and Joe didn't use any distortion on his guitar. So that, that's what really made them sound different. It was like punk rock without the crunch. And mm -hmm. I think that also, I'm not sure if he was in the sky. I can't really remember them talking a lot about ska, but, but his guitar sound was pretty in line with whoever Andy Cox from the, the English beat or uh, Roddy radiation. Yeah. We, we had Joe on the show and yeah, he was definitely a fan of two tone ska. Oh, awesome. Okay. Yeah. We never really, really talked about that stuff, but uh, you can definitely hear some of that in, in his playing. Like he, he was kind of a big upstroke guy. <laughs> you, <know? laughs> you were telling me earlier about um, like a tape was what it was. Um, it's a side project. What was that again? Uh, Joe and Dave. D Dave Blood was the original bassist, and he he died um, twenty some years ago. Th they had a duo, and my memory is they put this out, this tape out, even before the Dead Milkman even had a record. In my memory, mm -hmm. anyway. But it was called the Ornamental Wigwam, and um, really interesting stuff. Kind of pop. N not super punk. Uh, I can't remember there being any drums in it, but like really good songs. He's a really good songwriter. And, uh, and Dave was too. And when you combine that with Rodney, Rodney's this amazing front man and, and um, Dean's an incredible drummer. So it's all just kind of 
kind of clicked and it they definitely had to, had their own thing going which is which is really important when you're a new band trying to trying to get somewhere because they, they really didn't sound like anybody else at the time and so you booked their first show ever right i well i i i think so um i i, I was <laughs> i fudged the, this story a little bit because I, I i was i was too young to actually rent the building tim who was the, who was the second bass player in uh hair club for men uh he was the guy that actually i guess signed signed the paper that allowed this to happen but it, it was at a um uh, it was called the Senior Adult Activity Center in Harleysville, PA, which is the town we lived in. Nothing going on. And basically it was a, a, an upstairs, just like it was a room, like just a function room where I guess the elderly people in the in Harleysville would come and maybe play bingo or something. And they allowed us to have this this show there. And it, it was the Dead Milkmen. So we're talking maybe, gosh, when was this? maybe like September of 83. I was still in high school. So, um, um, so it was the dead milkman. I, I had a little funny project with Dan map. I think who, who went on to become the dead milkman tour manager. Um, or he might've just sat in with us. And then there was another band. I, th- th- there couldn't have been more than 25 people at this thing. What was your band called? It, I, it was called Mr. Happy. Mr. Happy. Mr. Happy, yes. And I think I played drums and sang a little bit. And I think Dean was in it too, maybe. And then Dean, Dean and I also had another uh, duo called the Drum Dorks. <laughs> the Drum Dorks? <laughs> yes. Was it just drums? <laughs> it, it, it was two drummers and us singing. And I know we played one show because there's a picture of it. Um, <laughs> and that, that must have been with the Dead Milkman also. And my memory of this now, it's coming back, is that show was at a fr- also at a friend's barn so many barns back then and and, uh (laughs) and i feel like it was very close to my graduation so this would have been this would have been like uh may of 84 you had a nickname called johnny earth shoe yes right okay yes and that that name is on the uh, big lizard in my backyard as like a producer or co-producer or something like this Yes, which translates to I hit record on the uh, on the cassette deck. I don't even think it was a four track, honestly. D- Dean had a four track and I'll never uh, thank him enough. He when when the Dead Milkman went on their first tour, he let me borrow his four track while they were gone. So I, I was I, I learned the kind of basics of multi-track recording uh, while they were gone. But um, yeah, I was in the in Dean's basement. uh and I hit record on, um, I felt like it was two songs. Uh, maybe one was called, um, what were the songs? Was, was one called Spit Sink? Spit Sink. A Spit Sink. A Spit Sink. It's nothing but a Spit Sink. Crazy song. And, uh, <laughs> and, and something else. Uh, so I got, I got producer credit on that, which is was a, a big gift, but, uh, and then I sing backup vocals on a few songs on that record. I was in the studio when they recorded it. Uh, I think the laundromat song and, uh, a song called Rasta Billy. Rasta Billy. Yes. Yeah. So big lizard, um, was recorded in two separate studio sessions and then also a couple songs from Dean's basement. That's the ones that you were producing for the Dean basement ones. Yeah, and and you know, producing in giant air air quotes, giant air quotes. <laughs> but you know, yes. it's on your resume. You can use that. It is for future projects. Yeah. A weird little fact is that um, your Johnny Earth shoe on the album, but didn't when it got put onto CD, didn't it get misspelled to Johnny Earth Shore? Yes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's bizarre. What's funny is, let me see if I can get this right. My, I have a memory of this. My, I, I got a job at a, at a mall record store in um, Greensboro, North Carolina. So th- this is 87 or so. And I'm not lying. The first purchase I rang up was Big Lizard on CD, which was so strange <laughs> but th- that the store even had it because it, it was it was a mall. And they didn't have any many hip records in there. So I thought that was crazy. When do you remember like finding out that 
the CD misspelled your fake name? I think I just, I, I don't remember being disappointed. Uh, <laughs> In the way I was disappointed when uh, the first Super Chunk thing I appeared on, uh, a, a, a compilation uh, album of new wave songs reinterpreted by indie rock bands came out, and uh, Super Chunk did a Devo song, and I was credited as John Wubster. Ooh. <laughs> I'm, sti- I'm still a little angry about it. Still salty about that one. 30 years ago, yeah. Uh, but the, the, the origin of the name Johnny or earth shoe is, um, by the time I started hanging around with those guys, I was, I guess I would have been, I think I was a junior in high school and I had a, uh, I was in science class, which I was so bad at just, I don't have that kind of brain for science or math. And, um, the guy next to me, um, wore these very, uh, intense earth shoes like the kind with the rippled soul and i just thought they were the the, the uncoolest thing anyone could ever wear so somehow i became johnny earth shoe i don't even know why (laughs) wait what's what's less cool those or the shoes with the toes i think now the shoes with the toes are are worse yeah Yeah, definitely (laughs) yeah i would even maybe wear earth shoes now just as a statement (laughs) (laughs) come full circle Yes. It took a few decades, but they're cool now. They are. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, so you were famously referenced in the song, uh, Stuart. Yes. Yes. And that I was, I was blown away when I heard that. Cause I had no idea it was coming. <laughs> yeah. So they didn't give you a heads up. You just listening to the song and there's the line about the John Worcester kid. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I was living in Winston Salem. I, I bought the record. And I played it. And I couldn't believe it. Um, and the line is uh, that Johnny Worcester kid, uh, the kid who who steals pa- no del- delivers papers in the neighborhood. Yeah, he's a foreign kid. Some of the neighbors say he smokes crack, but I don't believe it. Yes, and to this day, on Instagram or Facebook, people still comment on that, that, that I smoke crack. And also there's a line in there about, about a burrow owl. Like I was looking for a burrow owl and I don't think a month goes by where someone doesn't bring that up online. (laughs) I'm into it though. I like it. I love it. It, It's quite a legacy. Uh, I read in one interview where you said that, um, you still get free hoagies off of the Stuart reference. Uh, I, I, I'm sure I made that up, but, but, uh, (laughs) I, 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 I bet I could go into a Wawa. Like if I found a, a Wawa that's hip, had a hip person working behind the counter, I, I could probably get something. I mean, you got, you got a lot of good hip cred to get yourself a sandwich. Yeah. I think that's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Just a side tangent. I, I was another little dead milkman related story. I read about, um, you booked a del- you did you booked a dead milkman show in the late eighties and a Slovenian industrial band were on the bill and on their writer they requested an antique chair. Um this was a story they told me. I was out of the picture by this point. The show I I booked for them was in eighty three. So this would have been this would have been maybe I feel like I heard this story somewhere around eighty seven or so. The story is that they were playing with this band called Liebach. Oh yeah. And at the time, at the time, Leibach was kind of popular. And my memory of, of this was maybe Rodney overheard one of the guys in Leibach really excited in the dressing room because I guess they, they had on their rider some kind of crazy things. And one of them was an antique chair or something, something like <laughs> that, like a, like a nice, heavy antique chair. And one of the guys from Leibach apparently said, oh, my God, it's the first chair we've gotten on the tour. (laughs) (laughs) It's it's the little things when you're on the road. Did you ever have anything weird or do you have anything weird on your rider? No, it's funny with all the with Super Chunk and with Bob Mold and the Mountain Goats. We don't really work the rider like we should. Um you know, like we, we, uh, it, it's all normal things, you know, like water and some beer and stuff. And, and, uh, 
nuts, like nothing fun, like no candy, even no, no, like desserts, which is ultimately that's good because we're, we're, then yeah. you're not, you know, in horrible physical. Yeah. Food, you're not but... snacking on all this junk food the whole time. Yeah. Yeah. I dated, I dated a girl who played drums and she had uh chocolate milk on their rider. That's a good and idea. She would get it. It was always a. Uh, exciting because she didn't drink yeah right yeah johnny ramon and his uh six pack of yoohoo every night <laughs> can you imagine pounding a whole six pack of yoohoo no before playing a punk show no Ugh. but i'm sure i'm sure people ha- have done it i i did the dumb dumbest thing ever super chunk was playing in uh in phoenix and uh the aforementioned dan map uh who was the dead milkman tour manager forever. And he tour managed super chunk a little bit. He and I, and and Jim, I think from the band went out to eat and I decided it would be a good idea to do all you can eat fried shrimp before the <laughs> in, in Phoenix. And, and, yeah. and that was a terrible idea before the yeah, show. For so, sure. Yeah. How was that set? Awful. The club sucked. <laughs> the club was terrible. Uh, Oh, there's so many bad venues in, in Phoenix back then. Just, just terrible. Do you want to name drop that venue? I think it was called Boston's. Oh, I remember. Pl- I played there before. It has like an outdoor space and an indoor space. Yeah. Yeah. We were indoors. Yeah. The indoor space sucks. So bad. And we played a show. Does the name the library ring a bell? Hmm. No, no. I, I think it was in Phoenix. And it was the first show that we played with Rocket from the Crypt on a tour. So this was like 93, I think. And and I think it was called The Library. And they had these books on the wall. And it, it was like a rock club. I, I remember like Extreme played the night before. And the crew guys were very excited <laughs> about that local crew. And, <laughs> and it had a brass railing around the front of the stage. And my memory is one song into Rocket set, that railing was gone. Uh, so people had just like picked it up or just or dismantled it and just tossed it out of the way. So, <laughs> so we haven't talked about um, the Hooters. You were you were a big fan of the Hooters in the in their ska period in the early eighties, right? Yes, yeah, they were great. So we're talking eighty one, eighty two, mm-hmm. and they were they were kicking well before that. Um, they have a have an an odd lineage where the two guy, the two main guys rob uh, hyman and eric bazillion they had a, a it was either a duo or a band called baby grand and they got signed to arista records R- rob had a mustache at the time and um i'll never get over that mustache for some reason <laughs> how did it look but, uh, it was like a it was like a hard, it was like a thick mustache oh man so I think this record came out, this baby grand record. I mean, it's probably like 78 or something. Um, I've never heard it, but um, by the time they start the Hooters going, I, I'm not sure how they got into ska. I'm sure, you know, cause you've talked to Eric, I think, and maybe Rob even Rob actually um, Rob got into ska in the sixties. He went to oh, Jamaica wow. on a, on a family vacation. And he was no. like fascinated by the music he heard on the radio. And he like, scoured through record stores to find what was the song it was an eric monty morris song that he's heard that he like had oh. to own yeah wow oh i never knew that that's awesome um and so at some point the hooters come on on my radar i, I must have been gosh maybe just going into 10th grade or something and, and um um i think i first saw them on this local TV show that became national and was kind of a, a hit, a hit uh, dance show in the early and mid eighties was called dancing on air. I think it, it, I think the name changed when it became a, a national show, but just like American bandstand ki- local kids coming in and, and dancing to records and they would have live bands every now and then that would just kind of come and, you know, like uh, lip sync to their records. Uh, Robert Hazard and the Heroes, great Philly band. Um, and the Hooters w- were on it one day and they played this great song called Fighting on the Same Side. And it was their first single. Um, really great song. I, I think it-, it ended up on their first major album as well. Um, and so I got really into them. And it was at a time where 
these bands like Robert Hazard and the Heroes and the Hooters and some other local bands, the A's, were were trying to branch out and get young kids t- into their music. So they would play all ages shows sometimes. And so there was a very short lived uh, old movie theater uh, in a place called Norristown, PA, which is just outside of Philly. And someone had a great idea to, to put shows on in there and it didn't last long. But I saw Robert Hazard and the Heroes there. Uh, I think I saw the Hooters twice there. And they were so good. So this would have been like fall of 81. And my memory is they were just ska. Like there wasn't a lot of other music happening there. And it was super high energy. uh, And they would do covers like the Israelites and um, a song called Man in the Street, which I think was also on a single of early single of theirs. Yeah, that was a that's an old Scottalite song. And they actually got that song on the radio for a while. Wow. In in Philly exclusively, I think. Yeah. So you would hear them all on the radio, like up again uh, after whatever journey or rock the Casbah or, you know, whatever. And so that was really cool. And um, I have to give massive props to to their drummer, David Wasikin. And um, he was the first. Uh, He's older than me, but but like uh, he was the first local young drummer I ever saw that really blew me away. Like I thought, oh, my God, this guy lives kind of in the area and he's young and he's amazing. So he, he was a, he was a big early influence um, and they were all great. They were all great players. Uh, they had this great bass player, Bobby Woods and uh, John Kuzma was the other guitar player. And. You could tell they really, they were really going for it and not in a bad way. Like, you know, how how there's some artists you watch and this is like, oh, this, this band wants to be famous or this person wants to be famous. And you could tell they wanted, they wanted to be a great band. And yeah, they were, they were really good. And, and, um, it's interesting to talk to people that don't know the early ska hooters when you tell them about these early days of the band, because. It's so not really what they became. Um, although they've gone back to it. I was listening to the new one today and it's, it's a, a, a great return to the ska form. Yeah, it's great. Uh, that new record is, is awesome. I'm, I'm super into it. Yeah. I wasn't sure what to think when I saw the cover and, and the name of the album. And then right. I put it on and I was like, dang, this is really good. I was excited because they went back to the original font of, of the logo. Oh yeah. On that. Yeah. Yeah. That's nice. Um, so they, uh, yeah, they were, they were a a very influential band for me. Um, and I would record live shows off the radio. They're, they're pretty well documented, uh, which is really cool. They, um, they would do a lot of radio broadcasts if, if I recall correctly. So, you know, you're a kid, you would just tape, tape shows off the radio and you just listen to that forever. Yeah, it's interesting what you're saying because, like, when you're playing, um, when you're a musician and you're into all this music, and you, you know, you have favorite drummers or whatever, but there's something special about the local musician that you can see and meet that maybe they're not, even if they're not as good as some of these other drummers, it's still something about their their accessibility that sort of makes it seem a little more possible then absolutely just yeah just like oh wow ringo star or whatever you know like these some of these people seem like larger than life but the the guy at the local venue who lives around the street i mean it, it doesn't seem so out of reach right yeah and that that's what was so amazing about the the ensuing years for me um uh 80 83 84 85 like i i just think that's that's the greatest time for music as far as as far as as the stuff I'm into, so like you know, replacements, Husker Du, REM, that early stuff. Um, all those bands were 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 really influential because, like you said, it was guys and women who who were j- just a little bit older, but they were doing it, and you know that that's that's such a great thing for young kids to experience because it before that you know it was it was arena rock. You just, you wouldn't really 
think you could do it. And there's a great story of of the Minutemen. And I, I never knew the origin of uh, of their name. I thought it was in reference to like the songs being short or the Minutemen, um, whatever, soldiers back, back in the day. But uh, it, it, tur- it turns out from what Mike Watts said, it was originally the Minute Men. And, it, and they were called the Minute Men because <laughs> really? they would go to these shows and... You know, the the guys on stage were so tiny because it was it was an arena and I and they would uh somehow the the name Minute Men became a thing. And I think that's really funny. <laughs> that's fine. I didn't know that. Yeah, that's a funny story. Or maybe they considered themselves the Minute Men because they weren't stars. It was something like that. You probably were too young then. So did you did you get to see any of the two tone bands perform in sort of the yes, original I did. Oh you did? Yes. I did, yes. I saw, oh, this is, this is the greatest weekend of my life. I, I played the first Hair Club for Men show, uh, a, a backyard party, August 21st, 1981. And the next day we all went. So this is me, my brother, uh, a couple of the guys in Hair Club for Men, Dean from the Dead Milkmen, Mike, his uh, partner in Narthex. We all went down to this racetrack outside of Philly. And it was this extravaganza. Headlining was a special, uh, uh, the police, the specials, the go-go's Oingo Boingo and, um, the coasters for, um, reasons that were not apparent to me until 25 years later. What, what, what did you learn 25 years later? (laughs) Turns out the coasters, you know, who had these giant hits in the fifties, uh, were, uh asked to play miles copeland the manager of the police uh his wedding the previous day in new york so this was like a whole weekend so i'm sure it was like hey play my wedding and we'll get you on stage with these punk bands the next day and that's what happened (laughs) and they were it was so great they came out and my memory is they were just wearing these lime green suits like straight off the whatever the the casino they had just played the next like the previous week. And um, they were trying to be kind of hip. Like one of the guys looked down in the crowd and said, Hey, I'll have, I'll have that. I'll have a a hit of that joint. You're smoking like stuff like that. And uh, (laughs) uh, Hello, fellow youths. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Rock band t-shirt. And uh, (laughs) so every band was amazing. And I was 14. So this was like, this was heaven. And the specials were really great. And, my, 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 I think they, it was maybe just three weeks before they broke up. Like it was really close before they broke up. So, uh, ghost town was out more specials. Um, I feel like maybe Rhoda was even there and they did the boiler. I could be, I could be wrong. I know she did tour with them. I'm not sure if she performed, but yeah, she did tour with them at the kind of the tail end of the band's existence. I think she was there. I think she was there. Um, and they were just insane because, because they were, it was just, everyone was just going crazy on stage. Even, you know, Linville was going nuts and, and, um, uh, Neville and, uh, Terry, everyone was just jumping around the whole time. It was great. Um, they kind of stole the show. And then I saw, um, another great police bill. Two years later at JFK Stadium where Live Aid was, and this was REM, the best show I've ever seen by them, playing 20 minutes. Murmur had just come out. Uh, Madness. Uh, this would have been. Um, the Rise and Fall is the record. Yeah, It is. Okay. Yeah. So it, it had Our House. Um, what was the other big song on that record? Tomorrow's Just Another Day. That was the other single. Oh, I thought there was like another big hit on that record. Um, anyway, they were great. Like they had that same energy the specials had, and it was so hot. But I remember, um, who was the guy that was kind of the 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 toaster dancer in the band? It wasn't Suggs. It was another guy, not Chaz. Chrissy Boy. Chaz, I think it was Chaz, and he had on a wool suit. I just remember, like, I could tell it was hot from. 50 yards away. Like I could tell he was dying in that, but, but he, he was committed to it. Yeah. Suffer for your art. 
<laughs> yeah. So they were great. And then Joan Jett played it and then the police. But I, I feel like Orion and Madness were the were the hot acts that day. Mm-hmm. Um, and I didn't see the beat, who is actually my favorite of those bands, I think. I didn't see the beat until maybe seven years ago. So Roger wasn't even even in it. But um I went down this incredible beat rabbit hole last night in preparation. Um, Mm -hmm. Oh my God, what a band. And I'm uh, obsessed now with Andy Cox and, um, and uh, bass player. I'm I'm spacing on his name. Um, Dave, David Steele, David Steele. Thank you. Yes. So I'm obsessed with, I'm obsessed with David Steele and Andy Cox now just because they're, they're, their onstage energy was so weird. They, they kind of started just kind of regular guys playing, playing guitar and bass. They look like indie rock guys. And then as the band morphed into what it came into, they both started adopting these crazy stage moves. Andy Cox, especially just kind of this rubber leg thing. And it's in full effect when, when they started going on uh, in fine young cannibals. They're just like, they look so insane. It's, it's the greatest. I just love, <laughs> I, I could watch them forever. And it's crazy because you forget how huge fine young cannibals were. Fine young cannibals were bigger than the beat by far and bigger than, than general public by far. It's just so odd that these two guys that weren't the singer, they weren't the, the focal points of the beat became the most successful members of that band like that was the biggest record of that of that year in the world maybe yeah i remember i was like uh, 14 or something and that that's that song the the main single that song was everywhere yeah massive and they were just so weird those two guys those two guys are just i I i can't take my like i never even i never watch david wakeling or Roland Giff, the singer for Final Campbell. I'm just watching those two guys because they're so incredibly, strangely mesmerizing. I just can't get enough of it. So that's my damage. <laughs> how was that? How was the police on, at these two gigs? Um, they were great. Uh, the police show, it was just before Ghost in the Machine came out and it was like a one-off show that summer. Um, so th- they were playing a few songs from that that and the audience didn't know the songs because the record wasn't out yet, but um they were great. Um Stuart Copeland, just phenomenal drummer, one of my all-time heroes. That's a record I I, I really played along with a lot when I was just kind of learning. It, it was a bootleg album I, I bought. It was called Vinyl Villains. And it's mm. um it's a show, it's it was misidentified on the cover as being the whiskey in LA, but it uh it's it was a show that was televised and it's it's on YouTube at Hatfield Polytechnic in um England. And it's it's notable as being the first live performance of Message in a Bottle. And it, it it's like a, a radio broadcast, so it was super good good quality. And I, I just played along with that record all the time because the songs are la- are like faster than they are on the records and just super energy and um so i learned so much playing along with Stuart copeland and he he had a lot of um i think he he and david was sick and then are are kind of similar in that regard like super high energy but there's that ska reggae tint to it uh that takes it to a place that not really many other people were going to at that point and um everett morton same thing uh the drummer in, in the beat just a, just incredible drummer and it's interesting the differences between um everett morton and john bradbury who was the drummer in the specials uh Everett did a lot of what we call so- side stick that kind of reggae you know that 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 sound where you're just kind of hitting the stick yeah. on the on the rim uh Whereas John didn't really do a lot of that. It was more just kind of that, that eh, eh, kind of bam on the snare drum sort of sound. So um, I just bring that up to, to show that they're not everybody played the, played the same way back then. Stuart Copeland was probably one of my big, I played, I, I used to play drums and Stuart Copeland was probably my number one influence on as drummer. Um, I liked how he was always like slightly, slightly faster than the beat. like. 
Yes. Like, yeah. You know what I mean? He wasn't actually on the beat a lot of time. He was kind of pushing the beat. And I just love that. I thought that was awesome that he was just, he was just driving these songs so fast. I think it, I think it drove the other two guys nuts, but, but it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, I imagine so <laughs> there's, there's video of, of uh, Stuart put a, a really good home movie documentary out about God, maybe 10, 15 years ago. And uh, he shot a lot of home movies back then. And, um, uh, there's, there's, there's several instances in this thing where they're playing and you can just see Andy look back and just go slow down. <laughs> and, uh, I think that happened a lot, but, but you can't deny how on fire he was. And it, it's interesting. Like I, I, I think I prefer the studio records with the police at this point, because my understanding is the way they made records is that the songs that the songs that each guy would bring in Stuart or Andy, or for the most part, sting, he would just kind of show them how the song went the day they recorded them. Maybe he had a really? or, or, <laughs> or something. So they, they didn't really have time to work up a lot of the songs. Measure than a bottle is, I think is a, is an exception because they were playing it live before they recorded it. But, um, I think, but, uh, He's re- because he doesn't know the songs that well when and when he recorded, he's playing a lot safer. So there's there's not a lot of histrionics and it's a lot of backbeat, but a, and every now and then a cool little fill or a splash and those signature things he does. But then you listen to live shows like a month down the road, a month into the record release, and it's just a drum solo. It's crazy. <laughs> so uh, which has its own merits. But I, I, I think. Uh, for just for listening back to a song, you want to hear more, a little more restrained on the right. drums. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, the, yeah. The the song has more of a of a of a shine to it on the record, just because it's it's a song, but live it's a performance. This period of time in the early mid '80s, you're you're really involved with the music scene in uh, Philly or the larger area around Philly. Is that correct? I I didn't actually. I didn't make it into the city uh, until around uh, uh, I joined a band called Psychotic Norman. And so this is 85. So I'm, I was right out of high school. Um, and that's when I started really going to shows and, you know, p- punk rock shows and that sort of thing. And kind of being a, being a young adult, uh, you know, driving in, into town and that sort of thing. So that's when things really, really kind of opened up for me. What type of music was Psychotic Norman? We were, we were kind of odd. It was, uh, I think we sounded like a, a cross between some, a, a little bit of that Ramones kind of punk pop, you know, like th- that sort of, uh, melodic punk, uh, the fall, t- uh, two of the guys in the band were really big fall fans. So there was a, a kind of fall layer to it. Um, big Minutemen fans and our singer, what made it even weirder was our singer sounded like. Um, the guy who sang in kind of the Kermit the Frog voice in Canned Heat, uh, that band that played at Woodstock, <laughs> going up the country, like he he's his voice was kind of like this. <laughs> um, so it was a very weird band. It was very weird. Uh, so we would play with bands like, uh, Suicidal Tendencies, uh, Decroitsen, uh, and this art rock band that was kind of in the Sonic Youth world called Rat at Rat R. Um, Minutemen, we opened for them just before D Boone died. So th- things like that. Those are the kind of bands we played with. That's rad. What were the venues like? The punk venues back in those days. There were really good. Um, well, I can't say they were good venues, but but the promoter in town. The, there were a couple. One was named Chuck, and he was a great. He was a great dude. Um. And he, he and a couple other guys would rent out these halls. So there was, um, they were just like spaces where community functions would happen and they were big enough to have bands play. So one place was out in West Philly called the community education center. And I, I saw a lot of good bands, uh, UK subs, um, uh, government issue. Uh, I think Sam Hain might have played there. Um, Iron Cross from DC, people like that. And then um, there was a place called Love Hall, which was like a dump 
right in town where I saw Circle Jerks and uh, DOA and um, Minor Threat played there. And across the street was this other hall where X played and uh, Meat Men, saw the Meat Men on my graduation or my prom night. Uh, <laughs> so you did that instead of prom? I did, yeah. And, and, and I, I remember running into Br Brian Baker somewhere from Minor Threat and Brian and Lyle from Minor Threat were in the Meat Men that night. And, um, oh, they were so good. It was such a good band. And I, I remember seeing Brian years later and said, hey, I skipped my prom to see you play with the, the Meat Men. And he goes, well, I'm sure it was really worth it. Like, <laughs> the way he seems, he's such like a, a cynical, he's such a cynical guy in a hilarious way. That, Incredible. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but the, the, there weren't that many ska bands in town from what I remember. There was a band called Five Story Fall. That, that was kind of ska and the singer for that band was the guy that did psychotic Norman's uh, single sleeve. But beyond that, there weren't that many. There was a band called Scram um, who had some ska elements. And I think spelled, had, spelled S K A R A M. I think it was S C R A M. This was before the, the tidal wave of ska. And I, I had to, I had, I had to say that I kind of got off board before all that stuff happened. So I can't say I've ever heard whoever Sc Frank Scanatra or any of those, those, those ska <laughs> in the name bands. I, I, I think I sort of, what about, what about skank and pickle? Never. I, I never, I okay. never, I, I didn't like when the crunchy guitar came into ska. You know what I mean? Mm, okay. Like, yeah, th that's a, I feel like that's a real difference when I, I was doing my prep for this, listening to, you know, the, the two tone stuff, the, the eighties, two tone stuff. There's not a lot of, of, of crunch in there. Like Roddy radiation from the specials, he would do, you know, some single note stuff that was kind of distorted, but there wasn't a lot of like power chord crunch as far as I can recall. Yeah. So for sure. Yeah. And I, I think once the production got really tight in the nineties, it, it didn't have the swing that I, that I enjoyed. And, and that's no knock on the bands. It's just that that's where, that's where the music went. Did you like Operation Ivy though? Or did that not appeal to you? Well, it's funny. I realized today I don't think I've ever heard <laughs> Operation Ivy. So I Wow. So I I listened today and I loved I loved like kind of how loose it was and that it was pretty punk, but I can't say I loved it. I just it just I I, sure. I think it happened I was probably twenty two or three by this point, and it just didn't have the impact. Nico Case is, is a friend and she she had a funny quip about me once that was pretty dead on. It wasn't about that, but she said, you're too old to have gotten into Jane's addiction. And she was totally right. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely correct. <laughs> was there any other of the um, 80s American ska bands that you saw or got into? Like, um, uh, like, like, the, like the Untouchables or... or uh, I, I heard those records. I never bought them. It's funny. Uh, JD, who he, he might've told you about this he, from what he said, the untouchables were pretty big in, in his area when he was, he was growing up uh, in, in Southern California, in Southern California, particularly Los Angeles. They were a massive band. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I never saw them. I didn't get the record uh, fishbone. I liked, um, but I never saw them. Um, Name some. I'll, I'll see if if I had heard them or or saw them. Well, there's Toasters from New York. Yes, I like what I've heard. I know they are uh, they're very crucial. They're more in line with two tone. Yeah, Bim Scala Bim from Boston. No, no, like you didn't hear them, or no, you don't like them. I don't think I heard them. I think I think my. I think my issue was I, I really didn't like the Mighty Mighty Boss tones, like even early on. And, and I feel like I just kind of assumed all these bands would sound like that. So I never listened. Was that stupid? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they were, they were influential. Sure. I mean, oh, you know, th there was a really good band from here in Chapel Hill who, who, who I liked uh, back in the day and they were called the pressure boys. Oh, I, I, I'm familiar with that band. Yeah. I think I've got like a download of it on and I've listened to it. Yeah. Yeah. They made records and they, they hit it pretty hard in the early and mid eighties uh, here. And the singer for the band went on to produce or engineer a, a lot of the 
mid to latter day super trunk records. That oh, we interesting. Um, and they still play every once a, every couple years or so for a benefit. And they're, they're still great. It's really amazing that, that they still are great at it. And they did a, an incredible show. Um, maybe two, I mean, gosh, probably four or five years now, uh, ago. And they did an all special set. And it was so good. Like they really took it seriously and it was everything you wanted to hear. They brought in a guy to be, uh, uh, to be Neville and he was great. And, um, it's funny. It, I, I know a lot of people came away from, from that show just thinking, Oh my God, I forgot how amazing the specials are. Mm -hmm. So many hits. There was a meme going around for a while and, and I know you shared it. It's the ska and professional wrestling are the only true forms of art. Do you remember that? Yes. Do you remember that? I have, yeah, I have, I, I have no, <laughs> I have no idea where it came from. I just thought it was such a funny <laughs> idea that it's like, it makes no sense. <laughs> I don't even know if it's, if it's correct, but <laughs> I'll, I'll wear that <laughs> <laughs> for sure. <laughs> the, and you, and then, uh, so tell me the make a ska album you coward. Uh, I'm familiar with that account, but uh, they sent you like a shirt. Yes, I, uh, I must have post somebody probably sent it to me and I posted it and they saw it and they sent a shirt and, <laughs> and, uh, I'll, I wear it proudly. Oh yeah. You, you regularly wear it. I do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cause it's, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a real challenge because it's forming a ska band. It's not easy. You gotta, you're not going to make any money because there's, there has to be eight of mm -hmm. you. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, I, th I, I think that's what I did kind of like about Operation Ivy. The stuff I heard, the stuff I heard did not have any horns in it. Is that correct? Yeah. I mean, there's, or did they at some, point? yeah, there's only like one song. Yeah. With a saxophone. I think, I think I, I like that. I, I don't love, this is so nitpicky and so bitchy. <laughs> I don't love, I, I don't, I love the saxophone in ska. I don't love the trombone or the trumpet in it really. Although I, I know that's, you know, they have that in a message to you and, and a couple other things, but I think that's what I love about the beat is there really wasn't, it was basically saxes. Yeah. There was sax and then there was another guy. And sometimes mm -hmm. there were two saxes at the same time. And I just like the sound of that. Something about the, the, like the brass of the horns in it. I don't love, but that's my problem. Do you not like brass in general or just in ska? <laughs> no, I, I like it in like, I love it in Van Morrison music. I like that. Um, it's just for some reason in, in the ska picture, it, uh, it, something about it irritates me. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I, I understand that. I feel like there's, I feel like it really comes down to the players and the way that they're playing. Yeah. And how they're being utilized. Yes. Yeah. Like there's definitely like I listen to a ton of ska obviously, but there's definitely things tropes within ska as far as horns go that I'm not a fan of. Yeah. Oh, you know what we're talking about ska? I there's a DVD documentary I just picked up probably at like Amoeba Records for a dollar like t 20 years ago. And it's a documentary about maybe you you can help me remember who it is. It's um it's a documentary about a New York City ska band who wasn't very popular and they go out on tour and they're backing this guy um, who was like a, just a, a single artist, but he was a ska guy. I can't think of the name. I'm sure I'm, I'm not helping by not knowing the names of either of the <laughs> artists, but, but it's a really, it's a really good look at what it's like to be in a band like that and just do like a little East coast tour and the problems that befall the uh the young ska band i'll i'll think of it but uh uh it, it's a pretty fun look into that world what uh what other details can you remember about it i'm gonna look it up right now hang on um ska documentary 2000s i i i don't <laughs> i don't have it here i i don't have it here in my in my house it's in my storage place do you remember at all? Like, is it, is it professionally shot or is it just like VHS footage? It's kind of, it's, it's kind of budget. I, 
I feel like the the solo artist who who is backed by the ska band. I feel like he has the name the word King in his name. Does that ring a bell? King something. King Django. Or Prince hmm. something. That, I think King that's Django. It. Yeah, that's uh, Jeff Baker. He was in a number of ska bands in the eighties and nineties and and to the present. Yeah. Django as in yeah like DJ Django. I think that's it. <laughs> um. I'm not familiar with this documentary, by the way. I didn't know there was a documentary on King Django. I mean, it might it, it might even be on like a DVR. I mean, like a uh, what do you call it? like a uh, <laughs> the uh, a disc, like a like a self made video disc. But it's it's kind of interesting. Hmm. Let's see. I don't know. I feel like that's the guy. It says he was born in, born in '67. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know who who the band would have been though that that, he, that was backing him. Uh. Shit, this sucks. I shouldn't have brought it up. <laughs> <laughs> shouldn't have brought this. Up. Somebody will tell us who yeah, it was. But it's really good. And you know, and they go and they play to like twenty people or five people, every, you know, in the, every night, and it just kind of sucks. Uh, but yeah. but it's uh, it, it's a good look in, in, into that world. Do you like watching tour documentaries? I like it if it's a band I don't know any. If I don't know anything about, like that's what that's why I love this documentary. Um. Sure. Because I don't know. I have no horse in the race. That's what. I, that's why I, I like mm-hmm. m- movies about bands I don't know about or artists because I don't have any. I don't. I don't come in with any sort of preconception or or bitchy bias. You know. What I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Do you ever have you ever watched a, a music documentary for an artist you like and then ended up coming away with it feeling sort of disappointed in the artist and maybe kind of impacted your how much you like them after that. Well, you know, it, it's it's not a movie, but but uh, the the thing that comes to mind is this great book that my my friend Bob Mayer wrote about the replacements. It's called Trouble Boys. Mm, yeah, and I'm a giant replacements fan. But the takeaway from that book that a lot of people have is like, oh my god, <laughs> like these guys were. <laughs> I mean, these guys were severely damaged just by by life, you know, by their their formative years. Yeah. They just had kind of tough upbringings, but. That that's the one where it's like, oh wow, yeah, that's um, it doesn't affect the, my love of the music, but it's it's you feel like, oh wow, yeah, they uh they had some stuff going on that uh, I maybe I wish I didn't know about, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I watched a little documentary about the making of Rumors, and it made me really not like Fleetwood Mac. Yeah, sometimes it's 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 best not to know. <laughs> yeah, I, I love I love uh, ma- magnetic fields. Um kind of watched this one documentary and uh i guess i didn't really realize that uh steven merritt was such a such a grump such a like difficult person and it just kind of added this layer to their music that i didn't have before yeah yeah uh because he writes these beautiful these beautiful emotional songs you know they're kind of like in character or whatever but in in real life he's he's just like She's just like this weird, grumpy, difficult person who seems, and in the documentary, it shows him like, so having such a hard time communicating anything to anybody in his band. Yeah. Such a, such a weird thing. That's a real problem uh, with, with artists like that, who, who have a sound in their head and they just can't explain to the other band members what it is. I'm, I'm, uh, reading this book about about this uh i think they're known but they're probably not that well known uh band from liverpool called the laws back in the in the late 80s early 90s and they that's the band that did that great song called there she goes there she there she goes yeah. again that uh, someone had a big dreams. hit with uh yeah yeah and the main guy lee mavers that was his whole thing he just couldn't explain the sound he had in his head and they make this record and he completely disavows it it sounds amazing it's an incredible album and he never made another album and he just (laughs) never felt he got this record right and was always trying to like redo the songs and it never happened and so i think that's just something that some songwriters really struggle with and it's and it makes you feel really terrible as the the backing person in the band that you you're not giving them what they want and you're just trying all these things and it just doesn't, it's not what they want. Mm -hmm. 
So I think we should talk about your um, infamous uh, radio performance of uh, Ronald Thomas Klontel, uh, who yes. uh, insisted that madness invented ska. Yes. Yes, that was a that was an amazing night. Uh, th- that was the first call that Tom Sharpling and I ever ever did, and it was it was like Alex Chilton. First time he sings into a yeah. microphone in a studio, it's the letter, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, um, we we got real lucky. Um, basically, I I called in uh, to WFMU. Tom had had a show uh, at the time. This is nineteen ninety seven, and um. We just we had this idea that I was going to call in as this guy that had written this com- completely ill-conceived rock reference book uh, called Rock, Rot, and Rule, where basically you it just tells you <laughs> who rocks, who rots, and who rules. Just as stupid as that. And um, this guy this guy doesn't really have any credentials at all. And at some point, um, I. I, I Ronald Thomas Clontel, the character I, w- I was playing, says that uh, madness rules because they invented ska. And because it was the first call we'd ever done, no one thought it was it wasn't real. <laughs> Nobody thought it was it was it was like a, a prank. So WFMU, it, it was genius that it was on WFMU because the audience at WFMU is just hardcore record freaks. They know everything. So this was just like lighting a firecracker on, under these record collectors. And this guy calls in multiple times that night. And he's like, he can't believe I said that, that Madness invented ska. And then he starts naming all the, all these like super true original ska reggae pioneers. And my character just like, kind of just waves it off shrugs. <laughs> nah, nah, nah. And, uh, and then it, uh, I remember a, a couple years later, Robert Criscow, the the big music critic, he referenced it in I think in a preview. Maybe Manus was coming to New York to play a, a show or something. This would have been in the early aughts or or something. And he referenced that you know that they they invented ska according to this this weird guy or something. <laughs> and uh, so th- that's that's kind of followed me for the last. 30 years that that particular yeah um did did you think of that like in the moment or did you had had you had that in your in your back pocket like i'm gonna say madness invented ska i it must have been i I had very few notes it's funny like we we actually included the notes that i had that night in our box at the time when i put out um about six or seven years ago and it's remarkable how few notes there were basically it was just a few columns of who rocked, who rotted and who ruled. And that was kind of it. So now that I'm thinking about it, I, I might've made it up on the spot. I, I, I don't know. Uh, so it was, uh, it might've been just a lucky thing I pulled out of my ass that night. <laughs> it's a good one, especially 1997 Scott's popular in the U S again. So they're, they're an older band at that point, but obviously they're not the innovators of ska. So it's a, it's a funny claim to make. Yeah. And we also said that that David Bowie rotted that night because he he has he had too many he, he'd made too many changes over the years, <laughs> and and I I know this is this is probably not true, but um, you know he he was a guy that knew a lot about a lot of stuff that was going on, so I would not be shocked if David Bowie had heard Rock Rotten Rule at some point and it. it if you recall, he, um, he, his final email to Brian Eno, Brian Eno actually published this final email that, that David Bowie had sent him. And I think he signed off with something like what, what we created will never rot. Uh. And I thought, is it possible? But I don't, I don't think so. But I, I just think that would be the most amazing thing. If maybe that was a little joke between the two of them. I don't know. I think that's pretty good evidence. That he heard the bit and that he loved it. Maybe. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> so. <laughs> now, Tom, I get the impression, not a big ska fan. I don't think Tom and I have ever spoken about ska once. <laughs> I don't think. I don't think we have. Yeah, it's never come up. 
there's a weird little fact about him I, I, I found is that, um, so he was, I guess he wrote for, or wrote for a few episodes of what we do in the shadows. Yes. And so there's, I don't know if you've ever seen the Scott episode. This is ringing a bell. Yes, that's right. He's responsible for the, the bad ska band's name, ska la land. Oh my God. I don't, I didn't know that. Oh my God. <laughs> that's amazing. Oh, and, and then J- John Glazer, who is also a friend of ours, uh, he had that show called, um, um, fuck, what was it called? It was like, uh, he, he's a guy that, that, that's in, in like witness protection and he wears a, a ski mask the whole time. So no one knows. Oh who yeah. Is. Yeah. Um, it's called. Is it called like undercover or something? It was on Comedy Central, I think. Yeah, it's a one word. What's it called? We're doing so bad at remembering things. <laughs> I know. Well, you know, we got a lot going on. We got a lot going on. De- delocated. That's it. You got it. That's what it was called. And um, he had a ska episode. Like it was a ska party or something. for he, th- he throws a ska party for his son's birthday. Something stupid like that. Just the dumbest idea. The delocated ska episode is probably the funniest slash weirdest ska like TV yes. bit that that has ever occurred in any show yeah. because it makes no sense at all. It's just complete absurdity. Yeah. <laughs> delocated. That's always the one I recommend. People want to see a ska episode of a show. Go right for delocated. Yes. So there's a, there's a super chunk song from uh 2013 me you and jackie matu yes i'm really curious about that because jackie matu is a jamaican keyboardist played with the Scottalites. uh you know did some studio one sessions i'm just where that came from if there was any any story behind that um i don't know of a, of a deep story behind it but matt go matt goes su- super he, he's way into um Jamaican music. So he, he, he collects a, a lot of that stuff. So he, he's really deep into that. So, um, I, I feel like that song is more about record stores. Uh, but it, it's also it has to do with him finding a really great Jackie Matu record in, in, in a record store. Um, mm-hmm. so I, I don't know if the song is, is particularly a, about Jackie, but, um, I think that's the gist. I, th- I think Jackie was used as an exa- as the sort of the vehicle. Yeah, there's no reference of him or his music in the song, but it's a cool title, and I'm just curious. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, he he's he's been to Jamaica several times on on uh, trips and things, so he 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 knows what's happening down there. So is Mac more ska than you are? What's well, funny? <laughs> no, I think I think Mac is really is really like reggae and dub and that sort of thing. I I don't know if he's a big ska guy, but he um, I know he he really lo- liked the specials and the and the beat and the, the, those those sort of bands too. Uh, but um, I I think he's he's more reggae and and dub. Gotcha. Okay. And that's what I I really liked. Uh. And still like playing along with uh, dur- during the pandemic. That's what I, I really wanted to kind of get a handle on that, that kind of kind of drumming. Mm. So I, I would play along with um, a lot of that stuff. And my my favorite drummer of, of, of that scene is uh, is Carly from the from the Whalers. I, I think he's just amazing. He's he's um, he, he was he was really stupendous and um, horse mouth and. Uh, sly and those guys i i I love i'm not great at it but i i love uh it's it's a very relaxing style to play i really like kind of getting deep into that sort of uh groove if you will was there um any songs in particular that you really enjoyed to play along with yes i love this song it's on babylon by bus and it's called uh it's called the heathen i think it's originally on um exodus i think it's on exodus and uh He's just great. Like it's his, uh, I think the fact that his brother family man was the bassist. I think that that's what really makes Bob Marley and the Whalers an incredible band is that you're not going to get that same sort of, uh, is the word symbiosis. Is that what that is? Where, uh, sure. <laughs> I, I think like he, uh, 
if if you're playing with your 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 brother from birth, it's going to be a whole different thing, I think. And and they just mm. were so locked in, and just uh, it's like one one being the two of those guys playing together. Um, uh, so yeah, that's that's the one I really uh, that's a song I particularly love playing too. But all all, all kinds of things I love. Uh, I Roy and You Roy and uh, uh, Johnny Clark, all those all those people. So can you can you play the one drop beat? Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> still working on it. I'm still working on all of it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's interesting how challenging it is when you didn't grow up playing it. Yeah. Everything is the opposite. Yeah. And so even if even if when you do play it technically correct, you don't like have a good groove to it because No. It's not natural. Absolutely. And, and, and it's funny, I um this friend of mine, Joe Wong, uh, had a great podcast called uh, The Trap Set, and he would interview a lot of famous drummers. And um, every now and then he would ask me to s- submit questions. And I, I asked him about I asked him to ask uh, Sly Dunbar about playing on um, this record uh, Infidels by Bob Dylan. And there there's not a lot of reggae on it. Like he's playing the snare. He's playing like backbeats. And I, I wanted to know how he how he n- knew that stuff so well. And he said when, when they were young, they would play like ho- uh, hotels and things and they would play rock and roll like that. That's what the people wanted to hear from them at, at that point, like back, back when they were kids. So um, he already had that in, in the quiver when it came time to, to play rock and roll on with Bob Dylan or, or whoever. So I, I think that's really interesting. And, um, but a lot of those guys, that's all they knew was was reggae playing that. Mm-hmm. So that's why they're that's why they're so amazing at it because they really didn't didn't do a lot of other kind of music. And now, like when you're a rock and roll drummer and you're trying to learn reggae, it's pretty it's pretty confounding. You, you know, we hear something totally um, really bizarre um, about Sly and Robbie. So when we interviewed the Hooters, you know how they uh, they made the uh, Cindy Lopper's "She's So Unusual" yeah. record with them, right? Okay, so. They told us that they brought in Sly and Robbie to do a version of Girls Just Want to Have Fun. No, I've never heard this. And there's no existing recording of it, and it's supposedly not good. Wow. <laughs> it did not go well. That's why Were they just like in, in the area, or did they? I can't imagine they could afford to bring them up. If I remember right, they said, I think they said they flew them in at like their own expense. Wow. Amazing. Because they were just trying um, all kinds of things for that record. Oh my god, that's crazy! So okay, you did an uh, and asked me anything on Reddit, and um, there was one little tidbit that I that it piqued my curiosity. Mountain goats were playing a show somewhere at a, at a dive bar in California, and you caught a glimpse of John saying to himself in a mirror, "You chose this life." We we <laughs> referenced this daily to this day do you <laughs> oh yes yeah like when it, basically we were playing some it, it was it was in the inland empire somewhere so it was it was you know that weird kind of strip mall sort of world and um we were playing a venue and it just, the vibe was just kind of bad it, it wasn't like like oppressive it was just and eh, this isn't kind of the this isn't conducive to what we want to do really and so this <laughs> the dressing room kind of <laughs> kind of opened up right onto the stage pretty much. And we were about to go on and and we're all just kind of in a weird state. And John looks in the mirror and we're all kind of standing watching. And he just goes, he looks at his reflection and says, you chose this life. (laughs) And so to to this day, whenever there's something that's even like, it's funnier if it's something super minor, like just something that no one should be annoyed by. I chose this life. (laughs) <laughs> this is what you get it lives on yeah it lives on <laughs> we gotta adopt that too that super pertains to my my instagram world where i i get 50 of these horrific submissions every day of these weird pictures people send me of like gross sexual signs or things like that and i'm constantly <laughs> going hey i ch- i chose this i guess so I I'm, chose a, I'm, this the ma- I'm, the, I'm the magnet. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even think, like, as I, 
I follow you on Instagram. I see your posts. Um, I didn't even think of like, oh, he's getting people sending him weird shit. Oh, that's all it is. I, I don't find any of it really. Really? <laughs> like maybe maybe three percent are, are things that I've actually seen. Uh, how did how did you become that person? I don't even remember when it started. Isn't that crazy? Like it's it's almost <laughs> like it's almost like asking who created God. It's just like it's just it's always been there. Apparently. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, you chose it, so. I did, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Don't go anywhere. If you want to hear the rest of this conversation, head over to our Patreon. Thank you for listening to In Defense of Scott. Please rate and review this podcast and tell a friend. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at In Defense of Ska. Pick up Aaron's book, In Defense of Ska, at your local bookstore or online. This podcast is edited by Chris Reeves of Ska Punk International. This is your co-host, Adam Davis of Omnigon, leading you by saying Ska now more than ever. I like to, I like talking to drummers on this show. Yeah. Yeah. I think some of our drummers. I think the hierarchy of, of guests for me goes drummers, comedians, indie rock musicians, ska musicians. <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite question to ask drummers? Oh well, what the punk beat is, what they call yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> Such a dumb question. I believe the did we ask? I, mean, I think we asked John that in the behind the curtain. I can't remember, I th- but I think we asked him. So, I mean, we did this a while ago, so I'm, I'm just you know, who knows? But hey, listener, what do you call the punk beat? Well, go behind the curtain, and you won't be able to tell us. But if you're behind the curtain, that means you also have access to our Patreon, which means you have access to the Discord, and you can tell me specifically what you call the punk beat. Do that, do that, do that, do that, do that, do that. What do you call that? Yeah. Aaron, yes. who is going to be on the podcast next week? Well, they are a band on this little label called SPI. Mm-hmm. Um, the band is called Hans Gruber and the Diehards. Wow, that's a mouthful. <laughs>